Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Um, well, we got interrupted earlier. Hmm. Yes, we did. But luckily, all is well. Okay. Everything's good now. Good, good. We uh, we had done everything but set up the microphone earlier, and Gary got a phone call and then left to go to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my dad let sugar get a little low, so it was a scary moment there for a little while, but everything's good now, so All right. back to do the podcast. Yeah, and you didn't get to finish your whiskey <laughs> earlier. And- yeah, I almost finished it before I left out the door, though. <laughs> I was really close. I, like, I drank a bunch of it, and then... About just finished it. Well, um, yeah, yeah. I, I okay. So I can't get onto you quite as much about putting ice in this one. I still think that the cold <laughs> kills the flavor, uh, but I actually I add a little bit of water to mine. A lot of people would argue that the cold brings out the flavor. Uh, I would argue that. I I just I, I like disagree. a cold. I'm not much even like coffee. Like I don't <clears throat> drink warm beverages. Maybe that's. Part my of my deal. Beverage is not warm. It's, it's room temperature, room and I temperature. keep it nice and cool in this house. <laughs> yes, you do. No, no arguments there. Yeah. No, I like a I like a beverage as cold as you can make it. So. I, I like a good, uh, you know, um, maybe uh, Scottish type room temperature. Ah, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. Is that right? Yeah. That yeah. way, my scotch is right when I pour it in a glass. <laughs> it's yeah. at the right temperature. <laughs> exactly. There you go. <clears throat> oh. Well. Um, it's. I guess it's been a little bit since we've recorded. A week and a half, two weeks, maybe. It's been, it's been over know. a week. I don't think we've quite hit the two week mark. Well, that I have no clue. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Life's moving so fast for me. I can't keep up right now. So. Well, as Ferris Bueller told us, <laughs> life moves pretty fast, and if you don't stop and look around once in a while, <laughs> you can miss it. It's true. Yeah. He, that, that guy had a point. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Well. So I get the big news. Uh, in foreign policy, which is what I have the, the greatest interest in probably, um, is uh, Trump announcing that we're getting everybody out of Syria. Well, or re- of sorts. Yeah, <laughs> moving everybody out of northern Syria. Which is a big deal. Yeah. Um, and I'll, be, I'll tell you, so I myself, I was a little torn with this. So there's been a lot of talk. Um, I watched the Sunday shows today and leading up to listening to them. The, the big thing was... Well, we're, we're leaving the Kurds high and dry, um, and they're our allies, and we shouldn't do that. And I'll be honest, I fairly was, at least until today, fairly sympathetic to that argument. You know, you know I mean, they're an ally. They've, they've, they've helped us when we needed help, um, well, and so I have a problem leaving them high and dry. I've backed off of that today because I've kind of been waiting for somebody to really make that case to me. The, well, uh, if you'll recall, pro- six months ago, give or take, on this podcast, I yeah. said that we were going to do exactly that yes. at some point. Yes, <laughs> and you did, and I remember that, because we have to, because the, the, the at the end of the day, the Turks are our NATO ally, and yeah. that's an alliance we can't really break. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess we could. I kind of wish we would, actually. I, but, well, but yeah. the, the truth on the ground, though, that's not going to happen. Um but so I watched the Sunday shows today and I was waiting for them to make the big argument for why we can't abandon the Kurds. And that argument is Iran. Well, no. The, well, the, basically, <laughs> the crux of that argument that was made by Lindsey Graham and a couple others that I heard today was that we just have to stay forever. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. Anybody yeah. that's making the argument and really making the argument that we have to stay and help the Kurds is making the argument that we can never leave. Yeah. And it, I can't. that's not an argument I can get behind. If, if, you, if you had something that was a little more solid, some kind of transition or something like that, I, might, I may could find myself to support something like that. But I can't support, well, we just have to stay. Yeah, uh, we have to stay so the Russians and the Syrians don't do it, and the Syrians are the ones who should be doing it. Yeah, like the Kurds should should ally with the Syrians and fix this that way. Yeah, I mean they they could probably make some kind of negotiations for kind of a federalist type, give them semi autonomy in the northern yeah. regions of Syria, um, and you know that's honestly I think that's the only way that this ever works out. Peacefully. Even reasonably well for the Kurds. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, y- you might not 
realize this if you're just listening to the mainstream media, <laughs> but uh, Syria yeah. is in fact a sovereign nation with a government. Yeah, they they have there's a full government and everything <laughs> yeah. there. Like. Um, and uh, and they're actually a uh, sovereign government. I mean, Bashar al-Assad is um, is an optometrist. Right, I Maybe think. I'm anyway, not, he's definitely sure. he's a Western educated specialist physician. Well, yeah. yeah, um, he's you know a guy who runs. I mean, like he's you know it, it's a iron fist type of government. Yeah. But I mean, this is a guy. What who else are you going to have in this region? Well, uh, I mean, what the other thing that you might have that you don't in this case is that you might have a a um, you know a theocracy, and at the well, very yeah. least, it's a secular government. And yeah. it's a secular government that is actually really tolerant to religious and ethnic minorities, especially compared to other places in the region. Exactly. Christians can worship freely. Um, yeah. You know, Sunnis and Shia all live there in relative harmony for the most part. Yeah. Um, you know, they have allowed the Kurds to occupy the northern, northern areas of the country. Yeah. And, you know, so... That's the best way that this could end for the Kurds is to just have, uh, you know, have some negotiations with Assad. And yeah. they tried to do that before, and and the U.S. told Stepped them not in. to. Yeah, um, because we were the, yeah. at the time. We're it was, here to protect you. Well, you don't and, need to do that. Well, yeah, now, now they do. do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, and that's that's. I feel like I don't know. I heard Scott Horton talk on the subject, and I think he had. I think that's the right answer. I mean, if you want. Us to get out of that region, which at some point we have to, um, at least I think, I mean, um, that at some point we have to, that's, that's the right answer for them, mm -hmm. is, is to ally with the, with the Syrians. Well, of course, in the real answer is we never should have gotten in there in the first place. I mean, yeah. if you go back through the history of this, like it started with, uh, you know, what they call the redirection yeah. after um, American foreign policy specialists or <laughs> whoever is is kind of, you know, pushing policy in the direction that it wants at yeah. the upper levels in, of the federal government in this country, um, realized that they had just fought a war that empowered Iran in, uh, in Iraq. In Iraq, yeah. Um, and they said, oh, whoops, uh, <laughs> that's not what we wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, and so then, but there was that recognition that, they can't just go back into Iraq and fight the same war, but on the other side, because yeah. uh, that just makes it apparent to everybody how stupid they are. Um, yeah. And maybe that's too strong a term. How short-sighted, yeah, uh, they were, um, at yeah. least for a war. Oh yeah, yeah uh, that's... that's not going to be a, a cakewalk like they said um, yeah. these other wars would be. Exactly. Uh, so they're not even, and obviously these other wars weren't a cakewalk either. But they're not even making that claim about Iran. Yeah. Um, and so the idea was, well, we'll just fund the moderate rebels in Syria, uh, which is the Sunni jihadists, which was actually like these same guys that we had just fought against in Iraq as al-Qaeda in Iraq who had moved across the border, who'd fled across the border yeah. into Syria. And, you know, they were al-Qaeda in Syria, but they changed their name to Jabhat al-Nusra, right? <laughs> and so we were essentially supporting Jabhat al-Nusra, which is now... Um, uh, Fatal Sham, I think that you know. Uh, anyway, they keep changing. They names. change the names, um, yeah. And I don't know, even if it's those guys that are changing the names, or if it's just like uh, American foreign policy guys that are changing the names so that they have an excuse to continue <laughs> to fund them when everybody figures out what's really going on. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, so we we fund the Sunni jihadists in Syria to try and and disrupt and take down the uh, the Bashar al Assad government, um, and and ISIS grew out of that. Yeah. Uh, the, those groups of people that we were funding, the Sunni jihadists that we were funding, and the worst of them formed ISIS, um, the most radical members. They were occupying areas across northern Iraq and northern Syria, and we went in there then again. Now we had this excuse that we had to fight ISIS in these places. Yeah. But we didn't need to do that. Yeah. We didn't need to go in there at all because ISIS has enemies all around them. Yeah. Assad was enemies of ISIS. The Iraqi government was enemies of ISIS. The Iranian government is enemies of ISIS. Yeah. The Russians, the Kurds, everybody around them was an enemy yeah. of ISIS. Nobody likes these guys. Yeah. So. so we didn't need to do anything at all. And in yeah. fact, if we did anything for the Kurds, we did them a favor by yeah. coming in there and, and funding them and giving them arms and, and weaponry to help push ISIS out of their territory. Yeah. But they didn't really need us, and we damn sure didn't need them. Yeah. Uh, we didn't need to be there at all. Exactly. Um, 
<clears throat> so we, you know, we supported them defending their territory against uh, well, an enemy that we had created. And as far as ISIS <laughs> goes, I mean, if we're not all over these countries, we don't, we're, they're not really a threat to us. I mean, we're oh, a yeah. world away from them. Yeah. Like, I mean, they've got enough to deal with in those countries mm-hmm. alone. I mean, you move, you move U.S. troops out of that equation and mm-hmm. like they're, they're no threat to us at all. <laughs> right. So. Right. Absolutely. I mean, this is the descendants of the group that actually did attack us on 9 11. Yeah. Um, but which, of course, we also pretend that there's no, nothing that happened before that in the history of the Middle East, well, which, and, which is where I was fixing to go. I mean, 9 11 doesn't happen if you don't have all the stuff we did prior to that. Yeah. If we so, hadn't had bases in Saudi Arabia to, the, to bomb Iraq for a decade. Exactly. Um, then you, you don't have this you problem. You start bringing these people home and you start fixing a lot of these problems, for us at least, in mm-hmm. a hurry. Yeah, and that's exactly it. And this is one of those places where I think Trump has the right idea in that, you know, when people start saying, uh, well, oh no, what are, you know, what are the Kurds going to do? What are the Syrians going to do when the Turks cross the border? Um, well, that's a problem for Syria and the Kurds, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and exactly. it's not a problem I for I tell us. you, though, um, man, the media is just pounding him on this issue. Yeah. I mean, they, they are really relentless at it. And, and it's, it sucks, man. Like the, the one time he's, it's more reason to believe he won't do more right things because that's how he gets treated when he does. Yeah. Well, he's getting treated like that by the establishment media and politicians. Yeah. Um, the, I think that a majority of the lay people of the, just the general citizens of this country are cheering him. Understand what's happening. Yeah. I mean, I I hope so. uh, Even his base, like his, in in fact, fact, I'd say particularly his base. Particularly his base understands. There's no question about that. Um, because you'll hear them real quick stepping up to, to make the argument. Yeah. Um, and I heard some of that on the Sunday shows today too. So that's something, you know, at least, at least there are people out there that, that do understand what's going on and support it. Um, but it's definitely not getting picked up like d- throughout the week, listening to uh, and checking up on this stuff throughout the week, the regular mainstream media is not, Yeah. it's, it's all, this is just the worst thing ever. Well, uh, there's some parts of this that I think are kind of funny too, but um, I, I will say, and there was a recent poll of um, military, yeah. uh, active duty, I think it, I think it was active duty military, yeah. um, or at least uh, you know people who have fought in these wars and the terror yeah. wars, and like two thirds of them think that we should have never gone in the first place. Yeah, oh, the, the military guys, the, so the people that actually know the what was going that were on, on there. the ground and yeah. have have dealt with this firsthand. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's like um, with Ron Paul, when Ron Paul had the 08 and 2012 campaigns, mm-hmm. a big part of his support was from active military people. Yeah. Because they understand what's going on in these places. Mm-hmm. And, they, you know, I mean, the, he, Ron Paul's got the right idea, you know, to yeah. start bringing them home. That that actually reminds me, and maybe we, we cover this next podcast. I didn't get a chance to read the whole thing, but uh, our <laughs> Bill Weld. Oh. Uh, wrote a um, an <laughs> I haven't article. read it either, but I heard it's bad. Well, yeah, he wrote an article for Foreign Policy or Foreign Affairs magazine. I don't remember. Anyway, um, I printed it out, and like I said, I haven't gotten the chance to read it. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that we should probably go through that, and it'll and be a podcast it. primarily for the libertarians to say, what made you think that this guy that this guy would be a good representative for us in yeah. the you know in in a federal election in a national election wow. or at the very least i mean i i don't know have you um listened to the debate with dave smith and nick sarwar only some of it i haven't gotten all the way yet yeah um i haven't listened to the debate i only listened to his, the no, episode. i listen and i listened to the podcast yeah. where he had him on yeah and i've listened to a little bit of the debate but not i haven't got much because other things keep coming mm-hmm. up that are more pressing. Well, and I remember from the convention that the the one thing that I can say about Sarwark is that uh, just as he's a, a showman. No, no, um, that he's actually good at controlling the convention. Oh, really? And of course, a, a so convention. I, there, I don't know. Yeah, um, a, a convention of libertarians is like herding cats. Yeah, seriously. it is. No, and, been there and done that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's uh, he's actually quite good at keeping control and keeping people on topic the, and yeah. and moving forward because um, it can really quickly degrade into it can get out of hand in yeah. a hurry um and he does that very well 
Now, and I understand that he sees this job. This is, sorry, everybody. We're at the hole and it's all yeah. good. It's <laughs> um, important. He, he sees his job as growing the ranks. Yeah. Getting votes and getting more people involved in the Libertarian Party. And I, I get that, but... I they, I did get the impression that he is willing to sacrifice principle in order to do that, yeah. and I have a real problem with that. I have I have a real problem with that, especially to the extent that he's willing to sacrifice principle. Mm-hmm. I mean, I get you got to give a little bit, but man, not like what he's willing to give. Like, yeah. he's, he takes it way too far. And one thing that I have come to understand is that you don't build the party by trying to bridge the gap by yeah. being, you know wishy-washy and milk toast and well we're kind of like them and we're kind of like them the way you grow the party is by being the radical party because we are is it will and being what we are i mean we are i mean there there's a set of principles behind what we believe and the the way you grow the party is to educate people on these principles because i think that the principles that a lot of people hold and a lot of people once they understand where we're at mm-hmm. will come to our side. Yeah. And those are the people we want to come to our side, not mm-hmm. the people that are kind of, you know, yeah. We're looking for or, something yeah. in the middle. We're yeah. not in the middle. Exactly. Exactly. We're, no, I hold we're somewhere agree. else entirely. Yeah. Don't exactly. think of it as a line. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> if if there's a line then we're off the road. Yeah, yeah. We're not <laughs> we're not on that line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, you know, to bring it back around to foreign policy like, this is something that the Libertarian Party has been good on forever. Yeah, yeah, Like absolutely. You, we keep electing presidents. Like, like you, you out there, voters, yeah. you keep picking people that are making the claim that they're going to end our forever wars and stop nation building and um, bring everybody, bring the troops home. I mean, okay, so we'll go in order, right? Um Bush, uh, we won't use the military for nation building. Obama, yeah. we're going to bring our troops home from the Middle East. And Trump, we're going to end these forever wars. You keep yeah. voting for these people. This is what they're saying on the campaign trail. And that's well, for we... the 40 years that the Libertarian Party has ex- existed, we have consistently expressed yep. this message. Exactly. And you only go back three, but it goes back way beyond that. It goes back to Clinton and Bush one. Well, that's true. I mean, you can make those same arguments for them that they all ran on these non interviews Interventionist campaigns and mm-hmm. one got in office. This is what they've done, they and both lie. and both parties have done it. It's not yeah. so you're not doing yourself any favors by going to one party or the other. So yeah, um, if you want a party that really is genuinely about non-interventionist foreign policy, about using the military to defend the United States, period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then the Libertarian Party is the only one that has consistently expressed this message for its entire existence. And, uh, Absolutely. And in the the turkey thing, what I did get a kick out of, and it's you know we can talk about why the media is influenced in the way it is to try and perpetuate this thing. I mean, you know, yeah. Boeing is a big advertiser, and oh, Northrop yeah. Grumman is a big advertiser, <laughs> and like those companies are not selling to the people that are watching the news. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I always you know, get a just, kick out of that. <laughs> just think about who. Who that money money is really benefiting is essentially yeah. a bribe, right? To have favorable news coverage, exactly. Um, and or maybe it's not. Like maybe it just gets them in the door so that they can, you know, just keep talking to people and convincing them that that is the right position. I, yeah. I, I mean, I can't. I'm I'm not going to go all in that some kind of conspiracy, but well, um, I don't know. But I mean, you you watch NPR or listen to NPR, or any of those. I mean, that's when they go through the list of sponsors at the beginning. It's a list of your major military. <laughs> contributors yeah. every time um so. and uh something that was like there was a clear impact on the media that i was watching because i you know i watch international news and a lot of it's france 24 uh, yeah. that's what i watch when i'm getting ready for work in the mornings yeah. um and uh i don't know if you heard like there's this really interesting speech that um that erdogan gave uh now um erdogan is actually the leader that i have the greatest fear of i think that's guy i think that guy's a more dangerous leader well he's he's kind of just Kim jong-un or any of them i i mean i I don't know all the details rahani or but he's pretty well just kind of seized power in turkey right like he didn't start where he was at he's kind of shut down and and consolidated power into his favor he he has consolidated power into the 
president, I guess is his title, prime minister, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, he he has definitely like acquired more power for his position in the time that he's been in office. Yeah. Um, and they have uh, pushed this like really conservative bent where they're. Um, I, I mean, uh, Turkey had been liberalizing quite a bit, and they're not anymore. Yeah. Like, he has definitely reined things in. Yeah. And um and accumulated a lot of power for his position. Um, and he's manipulating elections, obviously. I don't know if you were following any of that news a couple of months ago when they were having yeah. local elections, and he had them rerun the local election in Ankara and uh, uh, so forth because the uh, opposition party to his party won. Now, yeah. they reran it, and the opposition party won again, and they yeah. let it stand. But um, There was definitely an effort yeah, put in there. There was to, some shenanigans. Uh, yeah. Like, clearly some shenanigans, but... Um, he gave the speech where he was saying uh, he was um, specifically talking to the EU countries, and uh, he said, um, uh, "You need to stop calling this an invasion. Um, if you continue to call uh, our operations in northern Syria an invasion, um, we're gonna let we're gonna push the three and a half million Syrian refugees that are in our country." <laughs> no, I did hear about Greece. that. Yeah, um, I did hear about that. And uh, like immediately afterwards, me watching France twenty four, yeah. it, it, they no longer called it the Turkish invasion <laughs> of Syria. They started calling it a cross border offensive. Cross which border thought, offensive, <laughs> which I thought was a, a really fun Very little euphemism. Clever. Yes, it's yep. a cross border offensive, not an invasion. Not an invasion, yeah, because <laughs> we don't want you doing that. <laughs> yeah, um, and and that's a lot of what uh, Turkey wants to do. Actually, they're trying yeah. to to move all these Kurds out or wipe them out, yeah. depending on your perspective. Um, and they want to the move you know, more than a million Syrian refugees back into northern Syria into those, yeah. those areas. Um, they're trying to get, get them out of there. Of course, like none of this is really good for their bit. Like they're trying to join the EU. Yeah. Uh, Turkey is. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think that any of this is a, is it's good for their good bit for to yeah. join the EU. Um, Oh. You know, because they the EU has said very explicitly that member states must align with EU foreign policy, and yeah. they're all opposed to the cross border offensive in <laughs> Syria. Um, yeah. Wow! Well. So I, I don't know, but I did think I. I did think that was funny. Like, I made yeah. it a point to write down that term <laughs> the because term, I was yeah. like, "Oh yeah, cross border offensive." Okay, so that's that, that's what we do it's too. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're not invading. Uh, Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria. We we're just <laughs> cross border cross border offenses. Cross border offenses. <laughs> yep. Well, I did think it was interesting listening today that there's um, a lot of talk of sanctions now, and that the the a lot of congressional support. I guess I guess they're fixing to try to get this through Congress to do all these sanctions against Turkey, which I thought was just the whole idea just seemed interesting to me that we can Congress can come together and do sanctions. But they can't come together to like actually vote on a war to yeah. actually go to war properly. I mean, we're still running off of these what you call it's from nine eleven basically. Yeah, it's a two thousand one, two thousand two yeah. uh, authorization authorizations. Authorizations, yeah. The we're still running force, off yeah. authorizations from decades ago now. Yeah, that are are actually they don't even apply anymore. No, we, they just keep yeah. expanding the definitions. That yeah, you know, um, I, I guess in a sense. Like some of these are Al Qaeda groups, yeah, <laughs> but I um, mean, it, it, it you know, doesn't really. It doesn't they change really the work name when me. it suits them. And the truth is that if you know, if the authorization is to fight against Al Qaeda groups, then uh, then I guess we're doing we're doing okay in Syria. We are fighting against Al Al Qaeda offshoots, but yeah. uh, you know, in Yemen, we have been siding with the Al Qaeda <laughs> offshoots. So. Uh, with yeah. the with the moderate rebels, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> oh, um, I just I got a kick out of your the what you said in your article about the moderate rebels. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> by definition, anybody that picks up a rifle isn't exactly a moderate. Yeah, I you know, and I, after I wrote that, um, I was listening to Dave Smith, and he he said, uh, well, you know, I go back to what Scott Horton says about uh, if you're taking up arms, you're not a moderate. And I was like, I never heard him say that. I swear I didn't steal it. <laughs> no, but it's it's a good quote, though. It's yeah. a good way to look at things. It's just, it's, it's common sense, yeah, right? I like, mean, if, yeah. you're, if you're ready to kill, you're, you're not a moderate. You're not a moderate, yeah, yeah. by definition. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, and the, the sanctions, they obviously aren't going to 
intimidate the no the Erdogan government. It's not going to no. affect the upper echelons. It's gonna it's gonna start killing It'll the poorest the people, people in the world. Yeah. It'll start um, affecting the people. Yeah. Um, which just is, like which they is, always do. Which we've talked about on this podcast before is the yeah, really the most him, really. yeah really the most cruelest form of warfare. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. but for whatever reason, people don't see it that way. No, it's it's it's, it's 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 far more dangerous than dropping bombs. Yeah, kill a lot more people that way. Exactly, yeah. a lot more brutal. Yeah. Um, so uh, speaking of trade and economic power. Yes. Um, the the other thing that I wanted to talk about, so we, we might actually pull off like a, a shortish episode, which would be interesting. Smooth transition there, man. Uh, thank you. Well, until you call it out. Uh, <laughs> is the uh, the little uh, kerfuffle between the NBA and China. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which I thought was particularly humorous. Um, so where this started was that the uh, general manager for the Rockets, uh, Daryl... Mori, Moray, I'm not sure how to say it. I was going to say you'll anyway. have to, yeah, I don't know. Um, he tweeted, uh, his tweet was actually really simple, right? so I, I wrote it down. This is it. Yeah. It was, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. Can support that. <laughs> yeah. So that's what that's what he wrote, and <coughs> China went nuts. Yeah, they did. Uh, oh, they went nuts. And um, and they and then the at first the NBA, well, uh, I, as I understand it, and I may have the timeline a little off, so correct me if if you recognize anything that I've got wrong. Okay. This. Um, but uh, initially, the NBA said we're not in a position where we're going to censor our um, owners, managers, players uh, yeah. from what they say. Um, but then <laughs> they also did everything they could to distance themselves from, from these that. comments. Oh, yes, they did. And, uh, in fact, the first that I heard of this was when I saw a video that was uh, with uh, James Harden, um, who's the guy with the big beard. Like, you, you would probably recognize <laughs> it. Like sure he's he's well known right. in the NBA for his, like, really kind of amazing the, beard. The man beard. Um, yeah. And uh, and Russell Westbrook, who, who are two NBA superstars, both also play for the Rockets. Okay. Um, and they recorded a video uh, where they were just going on about how wonderful China was. Um, <laughs> oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, it's like, uh, we love them. We love everything about them. Oh, wow. <laughs> and just like <laughs> on and on. Um, and I was, I, I thought, what is this all about? And I had to start digging and in, yeah. Figure out what was going on. <laughs> And uh, essentially what happened was the China said, uh, well, you're not going to get any more of our business. Yeah. Um, Which apparently, from what I understand, we have, the NBA has a really big market in China. Yeah, They huge. really, I mean, I didn't realize that mm-hmm. until this came up. Um, I mean, I don't, and granted, I don't follow NBA. It's not, I mm-hmm. like, zero interest in basketball, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't really follow any sports anymore, but. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. this is more entertaining. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah politics and foreign policy. This, you know, that's where the rubber <laughs> really meets the road, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> um, those are the the, the biggest games. There you um, go. But uh, yeah, so I, I I used to watch a lot of NBA, and uh, and the first uh, professional Chinese player was Yao Ming, who played I, at, with the Rockets. Yeah, and, um, well, that's and that's what I was learning kind of when as this deal was going on. That and I remember when Yao Ming was playing. Like I remember that. Like I remember that being a big deal. Yeah. But apparently, I guess when all of that happened, or when he came in, that China just really jumped on board with the NBA. Maybe they were on board before. I don't really know. But the idea I got from the reading I did was that, man, that, like after that, like mm-hmm. basketball just became a thing in China. Oh, yeah. It was popular in China before, but it was became it really much after more that. Yeah. Because he was he was also kind of serving as a as a diplomat of as sorts. As a liaison. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, bringing more NBA to China. And, and, and he was actually like actually bringing NBA yeah, to China. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, well, that's kind of what I was learning about when I was reading that. Yeah. Like, and apparently he's still pretty involved with some of that. Like mm-hmm. he's, he's a big deal there. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he certainly had a huge impact. And at this point, China, um, I mean, the NBA makes billions off of China between, yeah. uh, distribution rights and merchandising and, and all that the kind whole of thing. thing. Yeah. Um, and so it is a real cost to them to yeah. upset China or for China to boycott the NBA. Yeah. Um, 
and so they were they had a game they had a couple of games scheduled at that point that they were they canceled. canceling uh, yeah. they ended up doing I was going to say and and um, I did see that attendance at those games was still through the roof so yeah. the chinese people are not upset <laughs> they still like basketball they still like it yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though they said positive things about hong kong yeah. Um, the Chinese people still like basketball. Amazing, right? Amazing how yeah. this works, right? Um, figured somebody would figure this out by now. <laughs> but I think, and then of course, like we had a bunch of um, senators and representatives signed a letter to the commissioner, uh, the NBA commissioner, Adam Silver. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, with uh, a bunch of things that he should do and yeah. um, how he shouldn't bow down to China. And, uh, and of course, like then I saw uh, there was some commentary from Charles Barkley. Couldn't help but go see what that was, because um, Charles Barkley, you can count on him to say exactly what he thinks uh, without any concern for the consequences. Not, not pulling no punches, that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and he, you know, he said that he understands uh, that there, you know, that there are billions at stake, billions of dollars at stake for the owners and the players yeah. um, of the NBA from this. Um, and that, uh, you know, there was a bunch of hypocrites out there complaining about the NBA that these a bunch of the same people. Um, who criticized Colin Kaepernick for taking a stand are now criticizing the NBA for not taking for a stand. For not taking a stand, um, yeah. Which I think is a reasonable point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, and then these senators and reps, which included, um, what's his name from uh, Cruz, uh, Ted Cruz, Cruz and um, AOC. Really? Like, these these two people are on the same side for this somehow. That's that's strange. Uh, they wrote this letter to the NBA saying yeah. that they shouldn't bow down to China and that they, you know, all these things that they should do to stand up for yeah. American um, uh, values and so forth. And, uh, like, yeah. know, there's a few people that signed that thing that I'm not sure really understand what American values are. <laughs> but, yeah. anyway, I, I found that... To be particularly interesting too, especially since they're they they're not making these kind of statements about like the BDS movement, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. against uh, Israel. Yeah. Um, they're not making uh, certainly AOC is not making these kind of statements about the uh, uh, social justice warrior movement yeah. about how you know that <laughs> you shouldn't be able to censor people in America. Yeah. Um, they don't have any problem with it when it when it suits their purposes. <laughs> exactly. Um, and and the truth is that China isn't censoring people in America. Yeah, they're just voting with their dollars. Yeah, just I mean, like that's... any one of us can do. Yeah. And and there's nobody like the NBA isn't forcing anybody to say anything either. Yeah. Um, but they are probably letting them know what's in their best interest. I bet they uh, are financially. Yeah. Oh, um, absolutely. But I I, I am. I am 100% certain that James Harden and Russell Westbrook were not held at gunpoint to record that video. Yeah, yeah, Um, exactly. And if they had been forced, I know that they would have had the opportunity to quit if they wanted. Exactly. And give up their millions of dollars a year (laughs) to play basketball. It's all about the money Yeah. at the end of the day. And so all these people are making decisions based on what's best for them. They're, yeah. they're making self-interested decisions. And that's what capitalism is all about. I don't have any problem with that. I don't have I any problem with uh, China um, withdrawing their funding. I don't have any problem with the NBA deciding that they think that that funding is more valuable than their principles. Yeah. I don't have a problem with any of that. No. Like all of these are private groups. I mean, China government, the Chinese government obviously yeah. isn't a private I mean, group. But all a- the stuff that affects Americans... Is all is, private is groups all private. making their own decisions? I would I would agree with that. I mean, I'm not a big fan of China in general, but I mean, I think that they're free to do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're you know they're a sovereign nation. I mean, if they want to treat their people the way they do, you know, that's between them and their people. Yeah. And I feel the same way in this country. Like I don't want to. I'm not going to exactly put up with my government doing a bunch of crazy stuff. You yeah, know? <laughs> I mean, it, I'll be in the street. <laughs> yeah. Now, the next step that would be interesting is if uh, the federal government like boycotted the NBA. Yeah. Because they, you know, bent the knee to China. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you can't do that. You can't respect this the sovereign nation that offers you all these billions of dollars. We're going to shut down your broadcasts here in the U.S. Yeah. And, uh, like, I don't expect that to happen, but honestly, no. it wouldn't surprise me if it, it did. It wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. I mean, 
crazy stuff goes on. Like mm-hmm. I saw a headline for the Babylon Bee that I mistook for like a legit headline the other day that yeah. said the NBA will now require all its players to stand for the Chinese national anthem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which when I initially read it, I was like shocked, and then I was like, oh, it's satire. Okay, yeah. I get it now. <laughs> but it scared me for a second. I was like, wow, that's like a that escalated quickly <laughs> yeah well uh, you know a lot of sports they play the canadian national anthem since we have canadian teams in our yeah. in the u.s leagues which i'm torn on where i stand as far as like the league forcing you to to participate in that mm-hmm. like you know well i mean at the end of the day you're on the my to, the the kind of breaking point for me is well at that point you're on the clock yeah i mean if you're out there fixing to play a game you're a paid mm-hmm. Employee. Employee. And that's kind of the way I look at it is, all right, you're on the clock. If they ask you to go do something, you kind of got to go do it. Or quit. Or quit. Yeah, exactly. You have an option here. But as far as getting on Twitter and saying what you want on Twitter, I don't think that the NBA should be able to censor you there. No, I think I that's your time and that's your you, – you should – you you have a right to have an opinion and mm-hmm. to, to voice that opinion. Um, however, uh, I do think that they have uh, the right to punish them – financially for any damage that it does to the league financially yeah and most companies have stuff like that in order so like the company i work for they have a social media policy yeah. i can't just go on social media and start bashing the company i work for right um and i think that's reasonable because i'm paid by that company yeah. <laughs> like it's really not in my best interest to do that whether i want to or not yeah i um, mean i don't like uh companies um censoring political opinions yeah, uh, I mean, I, but I, there is a time and a place, and you are a representative, and yeah. just be smart about what you have to say. Yeah, um, and you know the the general manager, he came back later, and he he kind of pulled away from what he said originally, and yeah. he said, you know, this is a complicated situation. I don't have all the facts, and I mean that's true yeah. actually. Although, uh, as a general rule, I would say, you know. Fight for freedom. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm pretty on the side of freedom. <laughs> but um, I mean, we also know we've reported here on this podcast that the there is some outside involvement that is yeah. manipulating the situation in Hong Kong. Yeah, maybe not in the best interest of the people of Hong Kong. Yeah, maybe maybe not. I mean, yeah, not on the ground. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I did think that it was pretty. It's, I, it's, I th- thought the whole fiasco was kind of funny. Yeah, um, it's it's definitely been something entertaining to watch this past week. Yeah, <laughs> as it kind of plays out. Yeah, uh, but in the end, I, again, I think the NBA is well within its rights to um, to uh, punish players for doing damage to the league financially. I think it's certainly well within its rights to make the decision for itself for the league that yeah. um, it, it would rather continue to get that revenue from china yeah um then give it up oh uh, absolutely and you know is the is the company really that principled to begin with i mean you know what company is i mean profits are king when it yeah. comes to companies i mean, I mean you can you can stand on principle and fail <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah. exactly um the the truth is that they probably uh, generate more revenue out of China at this point than they do in the U.S. Looking at some of the numbers I was seeing, I mean, that I don't know what the numbers are, but the numbers coming out of China are huge. Yeah. Um, so there's I mean, a whole lot more of them. There's three times as many Chinese as yeah, there are Americans. Yeah, and there's a lot of money over there. So, you yeah. know, I mean, like I said, I don't know. But you and make what's a the good other argument. big Chinese sport? <laughs> I, do they have one? I don't even know. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe soccer? I don't know. It's maybe. A, it's a big international sport. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, don't I can't know. think of anything else. I mean, Here we've got like several sports that are competing with the NBA. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, there are people yeah. like you that just don't care. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> a lot of us. Yeah, I'm definitely as far as the NBA is concerned. I mean, I watch a little football, but mm-hmm. that's that's really it for sports for me. Yeah, somehow baseball continues to survive, even though it's like the only thing more boring is golf. <sighs> I mean, I love baseball, but I haven't watched a game and couldn't tell you. I like going to games. Yeah. You know. Suddenly you're drunk and it's the sixth inning. You have no idea what's <laughs> happening. You've just been sitting there socializing with your friends out in the nice afternoon. Yeah. You know, that's that's what baseball is about, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> like if you're there, if you like watching baseball on TV, I cannot understand. Yeah. Um. I, I used to love baseball when I was yeah. younger, but I used to watch a lot of baseball years ago, yeah. back when the Braves were were the 
best team around when they had the best pitching staff in history. I can go farther back and remember when the Braves were just not that good. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that was right before I started watching. Then they got Glavin and Maddox and Smokes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I remember they were, those days too. But. They seemed like they were unstoppable, but just couldn't win a World Series. It was yeah. the dangest thing. They won one, didn't they? They won one out of that whole run. And they went like how many years in a row? I don't I know. No it was almost a, a decade, though. Like a big part of that was during a time period where I was in boarding school and then in college, and I didn't I, like, I didn't even see a TV <laughs> yeah. uh, for like six years. Yeah. Uh, so. You know. But at any rate. Um. Let's see. We're about 40 minutes in. Yeah. You have anything else that you want to address? or Not not particularly. Not tonight. We kind of hammered through our stuff pretty good. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, okay. So I, I can bring up, I was talking with a friend uh, last night, I guess it was, and who doesn't agree with us on some things. And, okay. I, you know, some of the sticking points are things that I expected. Uh, but one of them that came up was... Um, one of these things that I think is just a common misconception about libertarianism. It's a, a way that libertarianism is portrayed yeah. that I don't think is, is true. Okay. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit, sure. um, which is that, you know, that it's uh, emotionless, that it, ah. it, it, it lacks empathy. Lacks there we go. Empathy. Okay. Um, that, or, or compassion or however you want to look at it. That, yeah. um, that there's this, that the, you know, some kind of founding principle of libertarianism is that, you know, Every man for himself. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, you made the bed, you sleep in it. Like, you're just responsible for your own decisions, and if you made bad decisions, well, tough luck for you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he was saying that he believes that that there is a responsibility for people to take care of each other, um, yeah. to do things to help each other out, to support them when they need it, et cetera. Well, I mean, I would agree with that. And I believe it should absolutely be voluntary. Yes. (laughs) I mean, that's kind of where I come down as far as that goes. Like, I'm all for being charitable. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd be a lot more charitable. You can't see my shirt right now, but it says taxation is theft. Yeah. And, you know, if if I wasn't having a lot of my profits stolen from me, I'd be a lot more willing to give them up for charity. Yeah. Well, and I think that 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 actually brings up an interesting point, too. I think that that becomes a cop-out for people to not be charitable. It does. That's what I pay taxes for. Yeah. Well, and Uh, and even you talk to people who've never been exposed to libertarianism at all. Um, They, they, people really believe that, that, you know, well, I, I pay taxes. We shouldn't have people dying in the streets. Like, well, I believe we shouldn't have people dying in the streets, too. But mm-hmm. your taxes aren't going to that. Like, yeah. I hate to tell you, like, that's not what the taxes are there for, you know. Yeah. It's just I not. Mean, yeah, just uh, so I did have an article published at the Libertarian Institute last week um, called The Scandal of Coercive Charity. Ah. Although it's um, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's pretty close. And I offered up a bunch of titles. I don't remember which one was. Anyway, yeah. um it's about foreign aid specifically, yeah. uh, which is about – right now it's about $30 billion out of the budget um, hmm. every year, which isn't a huge percentage. But, no, but um, it's a lot of it's money. It's $30 billion that they're taking out of taxpayers' pockets. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you read through that article, you'll see that it goes to a whole bunch of stuff that you would never support if given the opportunity. Exactly. Um, and so – and that was the point that I made to him. It's like, I agree. I think that people should take care of each other. I do. And they should, uh, you know, they should take that responsibility themselves, the people to take care of other people. Yeah. Um, and that I don't, what I disagree with or what I would say is the problem is that I think that it is immoral uh, to use, for anybody to use the force of government to forcibly take money to give it to what they think those people should give it to. Exactly. And, um... It should all be voluntary. So I'm yeah. all, like, like you say, all for helping people. But I mean, I should help the people that I want to help, and the ones that I think have just need to suffer. You know, other people can help them. Yeah. Like they're, you know, warm welcome to. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I'd much rather keep it local anyway. Yeah, because that's the whole idea. That's where people are going to get, and and it adds a sense of responsibility to everybody. Yeah. If you know that the government isn't going to be there to bail you out when you get stuck, mm-hmm. that you're going to have to actually go to people who you know for mm-hmm. help, you know, or in your community for yeah. help, you're a lot less likely to put yourself in those scenarios. 
Well, the other thing is that, and I, when I've had this conversation with people before, one of the things that's come up is like, well, what if nobody's willing to help you because, you know, uh, essentially like you just you're not a very nice person and you like you've offended everybody in your community and now suddenly you need help and nobody in your community is willing to help you and and so forth and I, I said well like I understand the concern there first off there's almost certainly going to be somebody that's going to help somebody is going to um, step in but the second thing and I think that this is actually far more important is that if you can't depend on some faceless government to to give you help when you need it when you have to go to your neighbors or your you know community members hat in hand and ask for their help yeah. um, you and you know that you might, would have to do that if something went wrong in your life then that might create a pretty big incentive not to be an asshole yeah exactly that's going to and that's that's my whole point right there is that yeah you'll you'll start evaluating those decisions a lot differently yeah <laughs> and um, every and everybody <clears throat> will and it'll make people it'll make a more generous Nice society, more mm -hmm. polite society. Well, and we're already, like, the United States is already the most generous society on the planet by GDP. Really? Um, yeah, the, we, we give something in private charity. This yeah. is just, like, non-government. This is non-government. Um, yeah. In private charity, the U.S. gives close to 1.5% of GDP in really? private charity every year. And yeah. the next closest country was, like, Canada, I think. It was, like, 0.8. Really? Yeah. Wow. So we give almost twice as much in comparison to GDP. And we don't have a small GDP in this country. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, like, we're the most generous nation with our money in, in the world. Yeah. Um, as it is. While we're still paying, you know, anywhere between a third and a half of our income to the federal government in every taxes, year. taxes, yeah. Um, or, you know, to some form of taxation. It's not all federal government. i got to pay the state, yeah. and i got to pay some local stuff, too. Local, and, you know, they get you all everywhere. All that sales thing. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other important thing I think about it is that, you know, going back to that local uh, need and responsibility is that it builds a sense of community. And I think that that's something that's been lost here. And I think it's something that's yeah. important. Oh, and, it's absolutely um, important. The yeah. other thing about that is that the the federal government doesn't want you to have a sense of community. They don't yeah. want you to be more loyal to your community than you are to them. And yep. in fact, if you look around, you'll see, it seems to me, um, this might be a little tinfoil hatty. I don't know that if it's if it's really thought through in this way, uh, but it seems to me that there is a, um, a a pointed attempt to try and tear down groups that may engender more loyalty than your loyalty to your government, um, yeah. like family, like the general breakdown of the family yeah. um, and uh, religion and all these things that are that are competitive with the federal government. I would agree. I, I would say that, that you're right, that there's se it seems like there's a conceited effort. I don't know that there actually is. I think it's more of just the nature of government to, to kind of just... be the top dog. Just to... It, it's not... I don't think it's something that's like... Like you say, like Tim Foyle Hattie, like guys in smoky rooms making these decisions. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it's more of just the nature of how government operates... That that these it's in its interest to see these things break down, and mm -hmm. even if people aren't consciously making decisions to try to tear this down, it's just in the nature of government to do that. Yeah. So, I and I could be completely off base there. I don't know, but that's just kind of my perspective mm -hmm. of it. You know. Yeah. Um. I mean, there has been. Uh, you know, like in some of the communist stuff, when you're trying to, when you're seeking loyalty to the state, yeah. there is discussion of breaking apart religion, breaking apart yeah. family. Well, yeah. Um, so I, I, there are certainly and, people who have thought about this. And what's the other thing they want to do before they do any of that? Take the guns. Take the guns. It's always take the. They got to yeah. do that first. That's number one. You got to. Yeah. You got to take the guns. Well, you do it in a, a slow and methodical way so that people don't all rise up at once, though. Yeah. Like that was also a well, part of it. That's. They're not being. Some of our candidates aren't being so slow about it, right? Yeah. Now. Well, Beto's an idiot, though. <laughs> like that guy. He just. You know. He is an idiot, man. But he's got supporters. Yeah. Scared. I don't know who they are. I don't know who they are. Well, there, there's not many of them in Alabama. Yes. <laughs> so, <that's true. laughs> I mean, you, you travel outside our bubble and you start to meet some people. Yeah. I am surprised that he has, like, outside of Austin and maybe some parts of Houston, I I have a hard time believing he's got a lot of support in Texas either. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> 
Um, uh, but Texas is changing, man. Yeah, it is. Um, so. Yeah, because all the all the people that are um, Ruin fleeing, Cali- Ruin. fleeing the failed state of California are coming to Texas. Now. Uh, I'm all for succession, and I believe California should be the first to go. And when they do, we should build a wall. <laughs> Keep them in there, yeah. man. Well, they, they you know they're the fifth largest I was economy in say, the world. They've got a huge economy. They'll be fine on their own. They don't yeah, need us. They don't need all that federal help to make <laughs> exactly. their economy so good. Yeah. We need to just get out of the business of California. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of good could come from that. I think so too. Um, but we uh, we showed 150 years ago that seceding is not actually an option. Yeah, no, we we shut that one down. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about secession sometime too actually uh, my brother sent me this great well I say it's great I I haven't read the whole thing because it was really long and I got sidetracked I was doing some other things but I will read it we can talk about it (laughs) sometime in the future you should send it to me Um, because I'll read it but it it was about uh, about secessionist movements and it was critical of secessionist movements but I'm absolutely on board with them you know one of our principles here is self-government yeah yeah absolutely uh, so if there's some uh, some larger group far away from you that feels like they can rule over you then well maybe you need to do something to prevent that absolutely oh and that reminds me of one other thing um because this has come up a few times, and this is just going to be like one little quick hit, and then we'll get out of here. Right? All right, we'll start um, wrapping it up for just in the uh, the anarchy thing. Uh, oh. So I, I was um, discussing some political stuff with some people a couple of weeks ago, and uh, one of them said, "Whoa, whoa, you sound like an anarchist there." <laughs> And I said, well, Did you that's take that because as, I am one. <laughs> I was going to say, you take that as a compliment? <laughs> and yeah. then, you know, then there was this discussion about uh, about anarchy. And I said, look, you know, the, this idea that anarchy is chaos, right? Yeah. And I said, look, anarchy in a political sense isn't no rules. It's no rulers. Yeah. And they were making the point to me that there's always going to be rulers. Yeah. Um, that there are people, you know, like if you don't have three people uh left in your society or whatever that one of them is going to take charge charge. and start doing things and i and you know they may be selected or whatever but like somebody's going to be the ruler yeah i was like there's a difference between a ruler and a leader yeah like leaders absolutely happen and leaders uh, it, it is again voluntary yeah um and rulers it isn't yeah so true. just to, just to finish on that, um, yeah. we don't need rulers. Everybody yeah. needs like leaders are necessary. Yeah, but rulers are not. I'd agree with that. I would uh, definitely agree with that. And uh, and hopefully we're being uh, you know being leaders here. Yeah, I've, I've always fancied myself to be a natural born leader. Yeah, so. we're the we're the libertarian thought leaders of South Alabama. <laughs> of South Alabama, there you go. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, um, we'll just wrap it up there. Uh, I I hope that I hope you learned something. Um, hope it was fun. I, I had fun. Yeah. Um, to that. And we'll be back as soon as we can uh, again. You yeah. know, schedules are schedules are tough right now. Yeah. So I make no. We'll be back again next week sometime. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I can't think. I'm like running through my schedule right now. It's like there's no way I can come up with a day right now. Yeah. So I'm not even gonna try. We'll work it out. But um, we will. We will work it out. Oh, screensaver. Right, right. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, we're good. We're yeah, good. Everybody's still, still there. <laughs> everything's still recording. Good. All right, good. Um, yeah, usually I'm good about. It. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so also, uh, again, I mentioned it in the podcast, but again, uh, I had another article posted at the Libertarian Institute last week um, on foreign aid. I actually, I, I should have taken a screenshot because um, there were three articles posted that day. Yeah. And there was my article. Yeah. And right next to my article was an article by Jacob Hornberger. Ooh. Um, so those of you that aren't into the libertarian thing probably have no idea who this guy is, unfortunately. But he runs the Future of Freedom Foundation. He's has, a big deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's been a liberty activist for 20 plus years. Yeah. Um, he's a, a good writer and he's he's solid on 
pretty much everything. And he may run for president as a LP candidate. Yeah. And Possibly. He, he hasn't announced yet. He has not announced yet, but I think... He's fishing. I think that it is likely that he will uh, seek the not, the Libertarian Party's nomination for president. I think he's got a good chance of getting it. Yeah. Um, depending on who else is up there, like, I can't think of anybody else that I know of that I would rather have represent us, honestly. Honestly, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, a, a couple of names kind of float around, but no... I mean, he's one of the big ones. Yeah. Um, I I know that I can depend on him to to express the party the principle yeah. in a, in a good way, in a yeah. persuasive way, and in a in a serious and accurate way. Yeah. Um, unlike our last set of candidates. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So here's my article. Right next to my article is an article by Jacob Hornberger, and right yeah. next to that article is an article by Ron Paul. <laughs> and so I was like, man, I ought to take a screenshot because we got these three names and one of them is mine. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, that is a pretty amazing thing, man. And then I thought, what a terrible day to have an article posted because if somebody has time for only one article, like yeah. they're not going to pick mine, <laughs> It's right? not going to be, yeah. <laughs> well, you um, never know. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, article up at the Libertarian Institute. I'm trying to write more and get some more stuff out there and I'll let you know when I get articles posted. You know, published by other groups. Absolutely. And if I can't get anybody else to publish my article, we'll publish it on our own right. website and it'll be fine. We have our own website. We can yeah. do what we want. That is thelibertymike.com. <laughs> Feel free to visit anytime. Yep. Um, and then uh, there was something else. Um, I can't think of what it was. There was something else that I thought was kind of important. It must have been important or I would have remembered. <laughs> um, anyway, all right. Well, m- moving on then. Um, in the meantime, uh, you know, I hope you follow us on Facebook, uh, subscribe on iTunes, like and share. It really does help. Yeah. Um, and uh, join us next time when we finally get this right. Train and, how you fight. In the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao. Later.